to something to talk about. Our uh, Friday night music in the park spectacular. And uh, like every week, we start with a, with a short interview, and I'll get into that soon. But before we kick off, we always like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of which we're meeting, the Kumameri people, pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And also today, we'll acknowledge that a Kumameri man is here, and, and he's one of the subjects of the interview. So we're, we want to have regard for that, and I'm sure he'll talk a little bit about that later. There are three reasons why we do something to talk about. The first is economic. We hope that you come into the village, and just like these people in the front row here, you grab a pizza, support our local economy, and grab something to eat, building up our Friday night economy in Mudjabar. Uh, we also love this idea that uh, our our community is connected to like the cultural and historical background of our local area. So we, we love to put on acts, you know, musical acts from our local area, uh, and also have a bit of a chat about the history of our local area. And today, Land's gonna kind of spell that out for us. The last is social. And we hope that tonight, uh, throughout the evening, you'll turn to the people next to you who maybe you don't know, and just introduce yourself and say g'day. Um, we are hoping that you will meet someone new tonight, and that'll make our community richer and stronger. We think that's pretty cool. Uh, there is some thank yous tonight. This event could not happen without the Lions Club of Mudjabar, who are the community organisation who auspice this event. Big thank you to Sharon and Michael and the team from the Lions Club of Mudjabar for helping us out with that. Living Events are a great stage management and talent management organisation who work across the state, really, now, South East Queensland, and uh, they manage all of our... Um, all of our stage acts, all the, all the acts, and all of the kind of management around the event, marketing, videoing, and all that. Um, big thank you to Living. Uh, Courtney from our office is in the back there. Thank you, Courtney. She always manages all the back of house stuff and she's amazing. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, and this beautiful brown couch is brought to you by Bookness. If you need a book, you should go to Bookness as a word from our sponsor. They provided us the couch for free and very, very kindly have uh, let us borrow it for these interviews. Um, also, a massive shout out to Casey Decay, who's coming on a bit later on, and Huxley and Friel who are going to impress you with their bluegrass awesomeness. But let's, get, let's kick this off. Today I'm with a Kumamari man, proud Kumamari man, who is also a family man from a pioneering family of Madhubar. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your, your lineage, how that, those two worlds collide. Yep, so I'm Kumamari here from the Gold Coast. We, um, we sort of grew up in the area of the Runaway Bay area, uh, Southport area. I'm descendant of Wari. Uh, who was uh, a lady who lived in Southport and South Stradbroke Island, and Jenny Graham, and there's a, there's a sculpture monument um, for Jenny down at Hodder, the back of Hodder if you ever go there, called Keeper of the Light, and that's about her lighting the beacons in the broad border with her husband Andrew. And then on, um, on Mum's side of the family, I'm a direct descendant of William Duncan, who was the first white fella to settle on the Gold Coast. So I'm right go. in the middle there. You get both of them. Yeah. And when those worlds collide, as a young man, you must have grown up fascinated by that. Tell us what happened in school and how you kind of interpreted that. Yeah, well, it wasn't until later in school that I found out I was even part Aboriginal. So uh, as a little fellow going to Runaway Bay Primary and Guardian Angels in Southport, um, had no idea. And it wasn't until later. But that was kind of normal not to be told about your, your Aboriginal part of, part of you. We didn't, we didn't practice language. Um, we still practiced all the, all the skills of, you know, hunting crabs and fishing and all that sort of stuff, so we grew up feeling very natural about that. But we didn't really realise that until later. Right. So in this area, we have William Duncan State School, which is just 10 minutes from here, and we have Sid Duncan Park up in Lower Beach. The Duncan family have got a, a rich history in this local area. Do you remember ever coming to Mudjabara as a kid? Or was it just too far away? Ah, yeah, it was out of sticks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We used to go to Hins Dam. Yeah. So we'd go through and um, we'd always have massive Stanfield and uh, Duncan reunions and they were huge. Yeah. Massive amounts of, of rallies would come to those. And the Mudrabar showgrounds in that sort of little thing in there. We'd, we'd go in there and, and have, have get-togethers. I remember us doing a video a little while back about the Duncan family and they had one of their reunions at the Mudjabar Showgrounds as part of that. Um, and there's definitely a, a wonderful rich history. But, but there's more to you than just this history of both the First Nations background and, and, and the Duncan family. You run a fairly, you know, busy um, artist management company. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I started off uh, working in the ANZ Bank many moons ago and I hated it. I got to be a, a lending manager, so I was, I was giving out loans to people 
and I had a, you know, had my little office and everything, and they asked me if I wanted to go to Melbourne and manage branches down there, and uh, said no. And I left and I decided to go and do music, which was my passion, and um, did that, and have a look back, really, and then it sort of, it segued from music into uh, production, into just creating all sorts of things, and then I got back into my culture, so back into the Aboriginal side of things, and now I'm working at thing, places like Hotter and QPAC and Bleach Festival and Swell Festival, and managing and creating things through that through that vein, so that's really good. Yeah, and I've seen, I've seen you even involved in the Gold Coast Music Awards. You're doing the Welcome to Country there and getting involved there. And So tell us, you know, last week we started this conversation, we talked a little bit about Australia Day. How, how do you manage to balance those two worlds, um, and particularly on a, on a day like Australia Day, which is, can be a controversial day, and, and for some people quite a sad day? I think because I can kind of see both sides so I, I have a lot of rallies and I have a lot of friends who Australia Day really upsets them mm. and they will call it Invasion Day. Like they just don't want to have anything to do with it. And then on the other side, I see the, uh, the comradeship of it. I see where my grandfather, um, with his in being in the army and all that sort of stuff, and all the growing up here on the Gold Coast with my mum's family who were very inclusive. So. It's, you know, for me, it's kind of a day of celebration. I can, I can understand what the day should be, um, but I, I also sympathise with those who find it very difficult. So you, you touched on your grandfather there and his service, and I want to I wanna try to help people comprehend what it was like for an Aboriginal man to be serving in the armed forces. Yeah. Help me understand what that was like. Do, did you, get, do you have stories about that? Uh, a few little stories, so Gilbert, um, he went to war here with five of his brothers, so there were five brothers or six brothers from here that went went to um, went to war. He was a, a Ravager Brook. He was hand chosen to chase Rommel, who's the second in charge behind Hitler. Uh, nearly got him a couple of times. Uh, there was only ten of those guys, but he looked like a big Fijian man. He was huge, had the curly hair, um, really sort of uh, you know scary guy. Uh, lovely guy, but looks scary. Yes. Um, and he had to say that he was Fijian or anything else other than Aboriginal to get into the army. So we're not going to be an Islander, but it wasn't okay to be Aboriginal. Yeah, you weren't allowed to be an Aboriginal. Uh, if you went, in if the you, nation. If you served as an Aboriginal went over, you wouldn't be able to get back in. Wow. Yeah. What a so risk. Some of them were under age too, but they still went. Then they were, they were asked, why, why would you do that? Why would you go? And they said, well, because we're, we're protecting our people. We yes. want to protect this place. But we were very integrated too into society here on the Gold Coast. Yes. And the Leving family were rather well thought of and highly regarded and respected. So we were just part of the community and they wanted to do their bit. So when you welcome people to country, and there's a bit of controversy sometimes in our community about that as well. There's a sense of, you know, what do we need to be welcome to our own country? What does yep. that even mean for, what, what does that mean? And, and, and what is the, what is the, the poignancy of that for someone with a Kumbamari background? Yeah, so I think if you think of it, um, back, in, back in the day, a welcome to country would have been, you might have had a mob or a clan, so they were all different nations. You might have a nation here, the Kumbamari people might have been here, and there might have been some Bundjalung people come in, and what would they would do, instead of just coming in and taking stuff and go fishing and whatever else, they would light a fire, light some smoke, and let them know they were here. And it might be days, it might be weeks before the Comba Mary might go to them and say, hey, we've sussed you out, come and join us. And then when they came into that, into that fold, they would give them everything. Right. So they would just welcome them into the country. So quite generous. Very generous, but you've got to remember too that we never, we never felt like we owned this place. Mm. We were just the caretakers, we still feel that way. And a lot of the times you'll hear the old people ask, um, how is your country? So they'll actually ask you how the country is, because they know if your country's healthy, you're healthy. Right. So they see it as a as a mother or a father figure. Right. And so to, today, these days, when we when we engage in a welcome to country, that's really about us acknowledging respect for one another. Yeah. And the and the land we're on. Yeah. That it's all, custodianship. It's all about respect. Yeah. So it's um it's paying respect to those that were here before you, and paying respect to the the place that you're in. Yeah. I want to deviate a little way away from that. Obviously, you've seen in 30 years, 40 years, however long you've been kind of involved in music, you've seen the, 
the culture of the Gold Coast shift a little. What, how would you describe the, the music culture and music sector now compared to before? Uh, it's way different, <laughs> way different. So anyone that's grown up on the Gold Coast or used to come here on holidays, you'd know about Bombay Rock, you'd yeah. know about the Playroom, yeah. the Patch, the Jet Club, um, all the places in Surface that you could go and watch a band. So you might have, you might have like in Paradise City, you'd have say the Divinals playing there and the Angels or Cold Chisel playing down at Bombay Rock. And then uh, over at Fisherman's Wharf, you'd have Crowded House playing. Um, and you'd, yeah, totally. I used to, I remember as a, as a little fellow, I'd be at Mum and Dad's place at Runaway Bay, and I could hear Crowded House oh, wow. playing at Fisherman's Wharf, and it would go all the way down the Broadwater, and we could hear that. And then you might have Keith Urban, who was 10 years old at the time, playing down at the Pacific Hotel in the uh, Rusty and the Airs Rockettes. Mm. Yeah, so he was he was ripping it up back then. Wow. So there was. And that was all the time. If you see the old posters, you'll see, you'll see this lineup of artists, and you just go, "Wow!" It's like a festival. Yeah. But it was like on a Tuesday night it was this, Wednesday night this. It's amazing. And that was. Do you think that was kind of driven by that tourism? The place. This is the place we're going on a holiday, and the big acts just wanted to come. I think he just had people running the place. Like yeah. not not politicians. I'm talking about. I'm talking about these blokes that were running Bombay Rock. They yes. were. They they thought ahead. And they just created this party zone. And you got to remember, they used to have pyjama parties down at Cool and Gadda. Cool and Gadda was the place mm. back in the day. And I remember being dragged down there by mum and dad all the time on the weekends to go down there. And they'd obviously be partying, going to beer gardens and stuff, and we'd be down the beach. Wow. That was the place. And then heavily big pyjama parties. And then, then it gradually moved into surface. Surface became a thing and a place to be. Yeah. So you've seen that. that music sector change and you've talked a little bit about the First Nations history. How do you think those two things have kind of come together? How do you think Indigenous culture has kind of evolved or been perceived over the last couple of years? Uh, I don't know, it's sort of hard. I, mean, it, I guess there's been a lot of focus on it. Um, pre the referendum thing, it was, it was sort of gaining, gaining kind of you know, momentum, I guess. There was a lot, I, I, I certainly was have become a lot more busy doing welcomes and um, going into schools and, and helping them learn about culture, teaching, engaging, doing all that sort of stuff, but also teaching young people about their culture mm. because there's a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids out there who've got zero idea about where they come from. So I try and help them tap into that so that they can go and discover, like I did, I guess, when I was a kid. How valuable is that identity piece? And what do you do when you talk to someone about that? Well, I see the change in the kids go from being naughty, lost kids to kind of feeling like they're part of something. Yes. And then it straightens them up a little bit. Because you've got to remember too, a lot of these kids are coming from broken families, um, they're having a hard time at school, they don't really fit in because they, they think differently or they feel a little bit differently. So um, helping them kind of understand that there are other kids like them, they feel part of something. So we, we try and do that, try and connect them to being part of something and you see the change. And I've even had a meeting with a school this week where the principal called me in because he said, you were the, on the number one, number one thing that everyone said was the top priority that they loved from last year about the growth of, of kids and their their naughtiness had come down. So they we'd fix that up a little bit. I have to get to talk to my kids. <laughs> the naughtiness <laughs> might come down. It's you not know? working on mine though. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fascinating how when we discover our identity and we, we find our I don't like the word tribe, but we find our clan, we find our identity in our family that we start regulating our behaviour differently. Mm. Can you give me some examples of how you've seen that happen in, in, the, in the schools you've been working on? Yep, so say Coomba Bar for example, had a bunch of uh, young fellas and they said, can you come in and play some dig with them or something because they muck around a fair bit. So we went in and yeah, sure enough, first, first session they've got their didgeridoos and they're smacking one another over the heads. They're putting them up to their ears, trying to blow their eardrums out, as boys will do. They're putting them in a big line to see how long they could make the noise and all this sort of stuff. But about the second or third lesson, they started to settle down. We had little smoking ceremonies. We just talked to them. Um, we took them outside, took their shoes off. We got them into nature. And 
basically like probably a few months later when we were doing gigs at Hotter, I had these kids coming up saying to me how, um, how thankful they were. And then it wasn't just that, it was sure they were thanking me, but the teachers were also thanking me because they said these kids have now, are now coming to school when they wouldn't have been. And on the last days of school before holidays, we would have a meeting with the kids and there'd be 40 of them turning up. And the teachers would go, wow, like normally we'd only have like three or four of these kids here. We've got all 40 yeah, wow. have come today because you're in and we're talking. So I don't know what it is, but I, th I just think it's connection. They feel like they're part of something. Yeah, a sense of identity and of being part of something bigger. Is... Mm. So you've been part of a lot of big things. What's been the favourite event you've ever worked on? What's the, what have you loved best? Well, we did some huge ones last year. We played, we did half time at um, the Suns. I think it was like 30,000 people. Yeah, wow. Uh, for um, Carlton or Collingwood, I can't remember. I'm an NRL guy, <laughs> but I, I think it was Carlton. You so just we, alienated so many of our people. <laughs> so, so it was, um, yeah, 30,000 people with the kids doing their, doing their welcome to countries. We've done, you know, lots of lots of people over at, at Hodder. We've done 4,000 odd people in, a, in an audience. I think it's the growth, seeing that happen um, and watching, watching them grow in, in that space. That's been pretty cool. I mean, I've done lots of cool gigs over the years, but working with kids and having them connect and like not even bat an eyelid when they get out in front of so many thousand people and they smash it and you just go wow yeah. like they're so confident now yeah well it's wonderful having you part of our community and it's been a pleasure to be uh you know running something to talk about together with you and it's it's always great to come across people who are not just participating in the music sector and getting involved in that space but also this this mm. weird world where the first nations background and, and a pioneering family of our <laughs> local area comes yep. together so what a pleasure to have you with us land it's an absolute um honor to be interviewing you and thank you for being a part of something to talk about today thanks man yes thanks everyone